welcome to media. Uh, with 10 to 15 percent of infertility patients seen around in India, India is seen as an increasing center for infertility. Uh, is there any awareness being undertaken by government or you know are people aware about infertility? In fact, infertility in India and globally is on the rise. Presently, I would say around 15 to 18 percent of the population needs infertility help at some point. There are various reasons for this. I think India as a developing country, there is increasing women force. Women are getting educated, are having career goals and aspirations. And hence, the age of marriage has gone up in India over the last decade. Couples also want to plan their family because of social reasons and also career goals. And that's the reason infertility is on the rise. We also see that a large amount of male infertility is on the increase and this is because of sedentary lifestyle, work pressures and use of or abuse of drug, alcohol and increased smoking. There is not much being done to increase our awareness in India for infertility. You must understand that because of India's cultural status, Fertility is womanhood and motherhood and infertility is stigmatized in our society and this is across the country. You, you take big cities, you take small villages, it, the infertile couple is ostracized. Sometimes the woman can lose her inheritance rights in the society because she is infertile. It is easy to get remarried and have children rather than going for infertility treatments. Quite often when it is a male cause, we know of some couples, of some men who are married again and divorced and married again two or three times, being aware that the cause is with them but not willing to accept. There are a large number of NGOs and corporates who are working in India but because of India being such a big country, I think much needs to be done from corporates, NGOs, and I think the government should take a lead in doing this. An easier way would be to put infertility on medical insurance, which is not today, and infertility centers and people who are associated with infertility work in India are strongly, actively propagating this. which means having healthy diets, having some amount of exercise and not leading a very sedentary lifestyle. Smoking, regular consumption of alcohol, recreational drugs are some things which impede fertility both in women and in men. Regular coitus is something also very important and this is something which doesn't happen in couples who are working long hours or where both the husband and wife are working and quite often we find couples working in shifts, at call centers and they have different times of work schedule. In fact, we have seen in women who work in call centers and work during the nights and sleep during the day, we find that they have disturbance in their ovulation patterns, in their egg production and in their egg growth and we see a large number of these women putting on weight because of their sedentary lifestyles and this can affect them when they are trying to get pregnant. It is also important that the couples test themselves for infectious diseases like HIV, Australia antigen, VDRL and in certain sections of the com community make sure that they do not suffer from any genetic diseases commonly seen in our country is beta thalassemia.
very good question because this is something that couples ask us very often. Frankly, there are no foods which are pro-fertility. But we know that if you have a healthy diet, if you include large amount of fresh fruits, vegetables, salads, and try avoiding junk food, processed food, or quick meals, which contain a high amount of sodium, I think that will help you in a long way, not only to achieve a pregnancy, but also to ensure that that child or the pregnancy grows naturally and grows fine without any complications. There are certain myths regarding fruits like papaya or foods which are considered as heaty like chicken or egg, but these are really myths and there is no scientific research to suggest that these foods would diminish fertility or would cause miscarriages or abortions. Any good thing also in excess is bad and that's what we generally tell our patients that everything in moderation is allowed. So if you're not going to have 20 cups of coffee, if you have one or two cups of tea or coffee, that is fine. So really there are no foods which increase fertility, but we have to make sure that a balanced diet is essential. Yes, you are quite right. There are a large number of myths and if couples follow those myths or misconceptions, they in fact make their life very stressful and sometimes can actually reduce their chance of getting pregnant. The first myth is about the fertile period. Now we must understand that when an egg is released from the woman, the egg is viable or good to be fertilized for the next 24 to 36 hours. And a sperm which is released into the woman's genital tract, if it is a normal sperm, can fertilize that egg for even 24 hours thereafter. So you have a large period of almost 4 days which is a fertile period. And it is not the fertile movement which is important, or that, that time or that move or that moment is important. When we tell a couple to keep sex in the fertile period, they must understand that the sex can happen in those next two or three days. Because as I said, the egg and the sperm are viable for 24 to 36 hours to be fertilized or to conceive. This is the first myth. The second myth is about the frequency of sex during the fertile period. Quite often couples think that they need to have sex every single day in the fertile period. Now this is a myth because in, even in a normal man with a normal semen count, the counts will reduce the subsequent day and will reduce by almost 10 to 15 percent. So it is enough to have sex every two or three days in that period and not necessarily every day because the sperm counts would reduce. Timed sex, it can be very stressful to couples and often we have men who come back telling us they have erectile dysfunctions or cannot perform on demand. Now, this is very common and that is something that couples should understand that it is no point trying to stress the person to have sex at the drop of the hat or at that moment. It is sex over those next two or three days which is important. Actually not, the fertility in both males and females is on the decline. The awareness that there can be something like a male factor to infertility is something which has happened over the last 25 to 30 years. Previously infertility was synonymous with only women's factors or women's problems. And now we know that an equal amount of couples have male factor infertility. 
So that's why it could be presumed that male fertility is on the rise. Having said that, we know that because of the pollutants in the air, the pollutants in the water, because of highly processed foods, there is a large amount of estrogen content in the food that we eat and that is presumed to reduce sperm counts all over the world. If you take an average sperm count 50-60 years back, would be in the range of 70 to 80 million per ml. Nowadays, we barely see any males with such high counts. So we know that the fertility is reduced and this is also related to less exercise, sedentary lifestyles, hectic work schedules, abuse of alcohol, smoking, recreational agents and various other reasons. So to answer your question, no, the decline is both in men and in women. But because men factors are now coming up on the forefront, it may be presumed that there is a more increase in male factor in birth. Now this is something over the last three to five years as infertility specialists we are seeing a large number of women coming with a reduced ovarian reserve. Now we must understand that in women the eggs are there since birth and there is a certain amount of reservoir in the eggs or in the ovaries and as the woman gets her periods the eggs get out of the ovary and the reservoir starts reducing. And that's why in women you attain menopause when the critical level of the eggs in the ovary is reduced. Now that doesn't happen in men because in men sperms are formed only after they attain adolescent or adulthood. And a sperm cycle typically takes 80 to 90 days. So fresh sperms are formed every 3 to 4 months. And that's why a man of 24, 34 or even 44 years would have a sperm which is only 4 months old. Whereas in a woman of 24, 34 or 44, the age of the egg is equal to the age of the woman. Because no new eggs are getting formed. The eggs are there since birth and there is a steady, sharp decline happening in women as she grows older and a very steep decline after the age of 35. We now see a large number of women coming with low ovarian reserve and this is because of nature or because of age related. Compounded to that is dietary habits or even smoking and alcohol use. We see women who smoke have a lower ovarian reserve than women who do not smoke. In our country, in addition to this, we see a large number of women with genital tuberculosis or tuberculosis involving the uterus and the tubes and the ovary and this can actually destroy the eggs and the ovarian reserve in very young women is also low. Is there any solution to increasing reserve? There is no solution to increase the reserve. I think it is important that we pick up these women, counsel them that they have to stop smoking or treat them for their infections and quickly finish their treatments for infertility or to attain pregnancy. You're absolutely true. There is a steady decline through the ages, but a very sharp decline after the age of 37 and definitely after the age of 40 because the ovarian reserve dramatically reduces. And natural pregnancies or even treated cycles, the success rate is low. Generally, after the age of 42, 
the egg quality is not very good, there could be a large incidence of miscarriages of congenital abnormalities born in the baby in women over the age of 42. And hence, in such women, we counsel them for the use of donor eggs or donor gametes to get pregnant. We see a large number of women who now want to conceive after the age of 40, who want to prolong their fertility, and in such women it is very important that we advise them that after the age of 40, it would not be possible to use their eggs and they would have to restore to other males. You're quite true. Now, infertility has got synonymous with surrogacy. And it's quite a shame that surrogacy on its own is a good concept and it is very useful to women who have got repeated miscarriages because of some abnormalities in the uterus or women who have some medical disorders or illness which would make pregnancy a life-threatening situation. Besides medical reasons, there are various women who opt for surrogacy for social reasons. And I think that brings a bit of a controversy or ethical issues in surrogate pregnancies. Quite often, women mistake donor gametes for surrogate pregnancies. We know a large number of women opt for donor egg treatment when they try for pregnancy after the age of 40 and it is not synonymous with surrogacy. Surrogacy is where the egg, of the, the egg of the woman and the sperms of the man are fertilized in the lab, the embryo is created and this embryo is transplanted or transferred into another woman which bears the pregnancy and acts as an incubator to grow the child. In donor gametes, the woman's uterus is good, but the ovaries for some reason are not very good. And hence, you would want to take eggs from some other lady, fertilize them with the husband's sperm, create the embryo and transfer the embryo back into the wife. This way, the woman is pregnant herself, so confidentiality of the treatment can be maintained, which doesn't happen in surrogate pregnancies. Lots of men and women now restore to donor gametes because we also know men can have semen samples with no sperms or absent sperms and quite often medically it is not possible to treat such men and get the sperm counts back to normal. So a large number of couples if they are counseled well can avail of this donor gamete treatment. As far as third party reproduction is concerned, the large portion is surrogacy and also donor gametes, that donor eggs and donor sperm is also third party reproduction. But unfortunately media coverage and social coverage is of the surrogate pregnancy and because it, some centers use it for social indications, it gets a disrepute. But prima facie, the treatment is good and it is a blessing to some couples who can achieve pair parenthood by this method. The science is called as cryopreservation of gametes. And this is actually used in medical in indications. Now you have a large number of young men who are diagnosed with some blood cancers or cancers of the testes or some other organs which would necessitate them to have chemo or radiotherapy. Now the treatment for these cancers can render these men sterile, infertile and hence it is advisable to store the semen before they undergo this chemo or radiotherapy. 
technically it is very easy to store sperms and quite often we store four or five samples and theoretically it can be stored forever if they are stored properly in proper uh, canisters and labeled pro properly and these men can come back to use these sperms once they have finished their therapy and after a period of five years when they have been declared cancer free and are quite fit and healthy to marry and have children. The social reason for freezing in men is quite often we are men who travel for work, who are very busy schedules and cannot adjust it to the fertile period of their wife. And hence we can store the sperms and use it in their absence. We have men who are away from home for maybe a period of one or two years. And during that time we can use these stored sperms and try and achieve a pregnancy in these women. In women also who undergo what detected to have maybe like breast cancer or some leukemias or lymphomas at a very young age can freeze their ovaries, can store their ovaries and use these eggs later on to have a family. The social reason is women who do not want to get married or do not want to have children in their 30s and would rather wait for their 40s for career goals or for career aspirations would like to use their young eggs when they are in their 40s. So if, you, if these women actually undergo these proce procedures of cryopreservation in their 30s, the egg quality is good and if they want to come back maybe 10 or 15 years later in their 40s, they could use their eggs which are young eggs and these young eggs would give them a better chance of success to have pregnancies, a lower rate of miscarriage when they want to have the children. So this procedure, although invented for medical reasons, is now increasingly used for social reasons. And this is something that couples are getting aware that they can store their fertility for future or preserve their fertility for future and use their young eggs or their sperms when they want to try maybe in their 40s or in some men even in their 50s. Before we talk of success in IVF, we must understand that there are other procedures which are less invasive or less expensive than IVF and which would help almost 60 to 70 percent of infertile couples to achieve a pregnancy. One of them being ovulation induction and the use of IUI, intrauterine insemination, which would not cost the couple a large amount of money and the success range varies between 20 to 25 percent. But to answer your question, what is the success in IVF, presently in young couples who are less than 35 or 37 years of age, especially the woman's age is important, we would give them a success of almost 60 to 65% per cycle. But in the elderly women, women over the age of 37 and up to 40 years, the success would dramatically drop down to even 15 to 20%. Women who try for donor egg treatment in their 40s or late 40s, if they are using eggs of women who are young, less than 30 years of age, the success rates again go up very high and can go up to as much as 75 to 80 percent. So the success would vary primarily on what treatment is being offered, but the main thing is that age of the woman is the prime factor to determine success. An IUI cycle typically would cost approximately 10 to 15,000 rupees per cycle. An IVF cycle would cost in the range of 75,000 to 1 lakh of rupees per cycle. Per cycle. So IVF prima facie is expensive, may not be accessible or affordable to large majority of our Indian population. But newer centers coming up with medias and drugs being manufactured in India, with equipment being made in India, 
the cost is coming down and maybe in the next 10 years we will see the cost being halved as of today. I don't think that is the right uh, solution. I think it is important that we find out the cause of the problem. Quite often couples have to be counselled and quite often if women who have got polycystic ovaries with a bit of exercise, bit of weight loss and a bit of medications can conceive spont spontaneously. If they need any assisted reproduction techniques, as I said earlier, IUIs or intrauterine insemination, which is a simpler technique, can take care of almost 60 to 70 percent of the infertile population. So that leaves only 20 to 25 percent of couples who actually need the advanced techniques like IVF or the ICSI, which is the intracytoplasmic sperm injection, to achieve a preg pregnancy. Increasing awareness of these procedures making couples and sometimes even doctors aware that these procedures are available and that not everybody who is infertile needs to go on to the IVF bandwagon or on the conveyor belt treatment of IVF is something important. And simple techniques, simple procedures do help couples and will help them to achieve a spontaneous pregnancy. First, uh, Dr. Amit Patki giving us an insight in depth a real-time report about fertility, infertility and pregnancy. This is Apurva Bhatt, Media and Mumbai.